We've looked at a few different parts of this system so far, some of the hardware, the timing things, uh, the mathematics, but let's look at some raw numbers now and we'll start to get into the, the ugly details and why this system has consumed so much of my time. What you see here are 200 data points plotted. In this case, the tracking board was sitting still, so we're just looking at the jitter in the system. You can see on the left that while this plot may look like it has quite a bit of jitter, these values are actually quite small. We have 1.3814, 1.3813. So this distance right here is a 10,000th of a radian. Same thing here. It's actually quite a small amount on the absolute scale. If we plot more points, you can see what they look like. That's a pretty representative amount of jitter. We do have this trend that's going up very slightly. We're going to look at that more later. But this is over 12,500, which is roughly uh, seven or eight minutes worth of data, so fairly stable. This is a histogram of that full set of plots. You can see that it has a very nice normal distribution. And even with that 200 points count, you get a similar distribution. So that's why I chose 200 as my uh, number of points for making static measurements. What you see here is a steeper trend from what we saw in the first one. It has a funny stair step because I decreased the precision when I was printing it out. This is 1.2616 and then all the way down to 2606. So this is a very large drift. And the way that we got this amount of drift was that I had this set up in the basement where the air temperature is cooler and the lighthouses had acclimated to that temperature, not running, just sitting there. And then I, I turned them on and you can see that there's quite a bit of temperature-based drift. If you let it fully warm up, it'll be quite stable and over a long period of time, you will get a plot like this that's normally distributed, but you have to make sure it's fully up to temperature. And this was something I did not realize at the beginning. I thought that a short warm up period would, period would suffice and it really needed to be longer. These ones were particularly cold, which is why these are the most severe numbers that I got. But I needed to do some testing to figure out which part was doing the temperature drifting. Is it the lighthouse or is it the teensy? Because it could be either one. I didn't have a way to directly manipulate the lighthouse's temperature, but I did for the teensy since the chip is exposed. So what I did was to take an aluminum handled wrench, put it in the freezer, get it very cold. I had the teensy running over time doing uh, recording data. And then I put some heat sink compound on the end of that wrench and I just touched it so the heat sink compound would conduct some of the, the energy away from the chip and cool it down and sink it into that wrench handle. And I used the compound so that it wouldn't push on it or, or move it because that's what I'm looking for is a difference in position. Obviously, I don't want to physically move the thing. And this is the resulting plot from that. There wasn't much difference at all. Um, this plot is actually showing a few things. There was a uh, there was a period at the beginning where I didn't add any, I didn't change the temperature on the teensy at all. It was warming up and then I cooled it down quite dramatically. I held it on there for a minute, let it go. So there were a few different temperature cycles on that teensy chip here and it really produced no difference. And this is what leads me to believe that the temperature drift is uh, from the lighthouse unit itself. The temperature thing turned out to be more or less a non-issue. You just have to let them warm up. But there are some other details to take into account here. Those angles are not perfect when they come out of the lighthouse. We have some construction non-idealities. And it's not too hard to think about what those might be. So if these are our rotors again, and we have our horizontal one and our vertical one, and they're spinning, what sort of, what kind of properties are we relying on from that system? One of the most obvious ones is that we're relying, in theory at least, on them being perfectly perpendicular. And when you build this thing, they're not gonna be perfectly perpendicular. They're gonna be a little bit like this or a little bit like this. So that's something which could be uh, an, an error. The exact point at which they decide that they're at zero could be an error. If this is our lens, I attached this piece of wire on here so you could see what the angle was. We are assuming that when this rotor is spinning that this is per, uh, parallel to the axis that this is rotating on. So that could be a little bit crooked like this. It could also be a little bit crooked like this, meaning that the beam is not pointed straight at the axis of rotation. These are all things which may need to be corrected. And when I talked about the sync flashes transmitting 
uh, data bits, those data bits can be strung together in what's, into what's called an OOTX frame. I'm gonna put up a screenshot here of uh, Nudix frame. They just come in as half precision floats and applying these FCAL values turned out to be uh, quite, a, quite a time sink for me. I made a post on the Vive subreddit and uh, Mr. Alan Yates, the creator or head engineer of this system, was kind enough to respond and help clue me in on some of these values. The phase one is a fairly obvious one. It's just some sort of angular correction to whatever reading comes out of this, but the other ones were pretty baffling and that's where some of his hints came in extremely helpful because I had I had no clue what gibbous phase and gibbous magnitude meant. Whenever you say gibbous, I, you think of the moon, and looking up definitions, that's, that's about as far as I could get. But based on his comments and a lot of thinking, uh, the phase one is just a plus minus correction to whatever angle comes in and out. The tilt, I believe, is the correction like this for the beam being uh, not parallel to the axis of rotation, and so that'll just be in radians. The curve is actually a correction for this beam not being flat. This is my understanding from his comments, because this beam actually turns into a bit of a conic, like that. And there are different ways to define a curve, but since there was only one value here, I thought that the most likely way would be simply that it's a coefficient on an x squared. So you take however far you are away from the center, you square that value and it's a coefficient on top of that, because that lets you define a curve uh, with just one value, whereas a circle or an ellipse, you need different coefficients. So that's what I used for the curve. And the gibbous phase and magnitude, he said, is a correction for misalignment. I believe it's this way. And that produces a different error depending on where you are. It has to do with the fact that they actually shine the laser beam down the center of this. And so this, basically the error changes as it rotates around. And so this is given as a phase and a magnitude the phase, I believe, being the offset for whatever angle it is when it starts, and the magnitude is obviously the severity of that. So what you would do is take whatever angle you have here and then add or subtract, which is something we'll get to in a minute, add or subtract uh, that phase where it starts, and then use probably sine to convert that and then put the weight on top of it. And that would give you a periodic correction that repeats on every rotation. Plus or minus, as I mentioned, is a bit of a debate because the corrections could be this way, they could be this way. The gibbous one could be sine, it could be cosine, that phase could be addition or subtraction. There are a lot of different combinations there and the order in which you do it matters because going forward and then turning up is different than turning and going forward. So the order is very important here. There's another question too, are they compounding? So do you apply one correction and then another one on top of it? or do you use those base coordinates to stack up corrections and then apply them all at once at the end? There are quite a few considerations there, and since I couldn't figure this out, I ended up writing a program that just swept all the different combinations, which for the different parameters I had set up was about 800 of them. And so it would compute all the points and different things and compute the error based on these different combinations and try and find the one with the lowest one. And ideally what you would expect to find is that the one with the lowest error, that set of ways of applying those calibration values could also be used in different data sets and would also give a very low error for them. But that brings us to another point, which is how do you decide if it's worked or not? There are, as I said, different ways to do this because we don't exactly know what we are looking for. We don't have a giant reference object of a perfect size and we don't know exactly where the cameras are and their orientation which would allow us to say very accurately what image we should get out of it. So we had to come up with different ways to decide if our calibration values were working for all the different combinations that we're trying. The ray distance strategy, as mentioned before, was the first one that I tried, but the reason why I soured on this strategy was that I don't think it provides unique solutions. That's higher level math than I'm qualified for. The fundamental problem, even if you do more advanced cost functions so that origins don't slide toward each other, is that you can minimize the distance like this, you can do it like this. There are just too many options, even when you add more rays. I think more rays helps it, but it didn't help it enough, and so I moved on. While I don't have a reference object that I know the exact size and orientation in order to produce an image that I can compare to, I can use some other tricks, like the fact that straight lines always stay straight in images. 
Lines that are parallel will not always stay parallel, they'll go towards the vanishing point, but straight lines will stay straight. And so what that means is that I can take pictures and it doesn't matter the orientation or where it is of something that's straight and it should stay straight. So if I take a picture and it's curved and then I apply the calibration values in different ways and it becomes more straight, then that would tell me that I'm moving in the correct direction. So what I did here was to take my inverted pendulum track, which actually was not straight along the length of the track. It had a little bit of a curve, so I loosened these up, made sure it was straight. And then I mounted a detector onto here, and I set this thing up in different, different uh, orientations like here, kept this very still, and I took some points, took some points, took some points, took some points. I did it like this, and then I had this whole thing set up like that, horizontal. I should have had it closer to the camera to fill up, fill up the field of view more, but what that did was to allow me to gather points, which should be straight, and then I could measure the linear correlation on those and try that. So I'll put in some images here that I took down in the basement where it's this thing was very, very stable, everything's on concrete, but that technique didn't work either. I tried it several different ways and it just wasn't trending towards anything useful, so it was time to move to the next strategy. This wall behind me is not especially flat, but you can look down it, and I took my six foot level and tried it in different orientations, and it's pretty flat. It's flatter than the amount of error that I was getting with other measurement strategies. So what I decided to do was to look at the flatness of the points that I got from here. Because I was gathering my calibration data by taking this and putting it against the wall. So if this wall is within a quarter or three eighths over at, let's say a half, maybe the entire distance, then all those points, they should be pretty flat. I could make an estimate of the total amount of deviation of those from a plane and you can use the SVD again, which is turning out to be extraordinarily useful, to solve for a best fit plane through a set of points. Then I compute the total distance of all those from the plane, and I tried to use this to narrow down and figure out which set of calibration values, which application strategy was correct, and this didn't work either. My final strategy was a reprojection strategy. So we've had our thing on the wall, we've measured that and gotten some raw angles directly out of the lighthouse applied calibration values to those in various combinations and triangulated where those points should be. If those things are correct and my orientation and everything else is correct, if I remeasure those 3D triangulated points with simulated lighthouses, the image that I get from that, so taking a pretend image of the triangulated points, should match very closely the image of the lighthouses after the calibration was applied. And I tried this strategy, computing the total difference between the two images to try and hone in also, and that didn't work either. And so at this point, I figured, you know what, there must be something else going on here because I have tried literally every strategy that I can think of, and I can't get these to, I can't get them to converge on anything. Although I did think it was interesting because I can get them to all converge on individual data sets. You, you can force the error down to quite a small amount, but then it just becomes overfitting. And I have a, a plot here, for example, of one combination where you can see the patterns where they'll be stair-stepping the error down. And it's very frustrating because you feel like you're honing and you'll have maybe two sets of calibration data and it hones and it hones and it's looking good, and then it all falls apart in the next one. And that's where I just came to the final conclusion that there must be something else going on here. The whiteboard glare is pretty rough right now, so I opted for cardboard. These are our rotors here and here, and these are the lines that they project. So this rotor is spinning in this direction, and this one is spinning in that direction, and the lines are sweeping across. For this other thing that is going on, I'm pinning my hopes on this right now. I had seen mentioned, I think it was on Oliver Kralos's site, docok.org, I'll link it in below. And he mentioned the fact that these rotors are not in exactly the same spot. So this one is here. The center of projection for this rotor is actually right here, and this one is actually right here. But the origin of your system, at least the way that I've been doing it, is right here. Because this is at zero, or it's at center, center, and they intersect there. I've been using this point as the origin and using it via the pinhole model. And then I saw in the last video that 
Ellen Yates commented and said that the pinhole model and the cotangent relationship doesn't quite apply. And that has been very interesting to me because I've been relying on that. And this seems like a prime candidate for, you know, the other thing that's going on. It doesn't seem to me like this should matter because this is projecting a plane. So why would it matter where this rotor is in that plane? Obviously, if we're getting extreme, there would be different problems. But we're talking, in this case, about uh, roughly 20 or 25 millimeters, roughly an inch. Here, it, I don't think it would make much difference in the application of the, the values as far as tilt and other things. So it seems to me like this should be the origin. And I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about this. And I posted some questions here and there, but this is the big unresolved question for me. If that's not it, then it's, it's something else. But I've put quite a lot of time into this project. I feel like I've made a lot of progress, sort of bootstrapped myself on the math and the other things. I'm proud of how far I made it. But at this point, I need to move on with my life and uh, let this sit. So I'm definitely interested in finding out what the issue is here. It will be fun to go back and take some of my old data and calculate and try to figure out if I could make those work with whatever I may find out about this system. But at the moment, I think, I think this is going to be it as far as active effort. Uh, it's been fun and time for the next project. I concluded a little bit too early because I did have a couple other notes here. So my conclusion for the overall thing is that the system works quite good for VR, obviously. They've been using it for that, but it's not going to work for my thing, which is a measurement system. And that's due to the warm-up time, uh, the jitter, and just some other things I didn't appreciate back when I started. I also really wanted to think about what are the lessons that I learned from this. I put a lot of time into it. What is something that I can take from this, uh, general things, and apply to the next systems? I think the biggest one is probably that I needed to have more emphasis on measuring the system's jitter and noise and reliability right at the beginning. I partly wanted to get into this because I was excited and I just wanted to, I wanted to learn about it, so that forgives that a little bit, but if I was doing this more professionally, I think one of the very first things you would do is just hammer on what's the jitter, is it reliable, temperature swings, things like that. Uh, another lesson which I figured out later on was that you have to be, when you're comparing things, like when you're trying to figure out the error and other stuff, you have to be so careful about what you are comparing. Especially in the simulations, like I said, where things are arbitrary, you, you have to make sure that when you're comparing things that you know what you are comparing because it's very easy to get off track. The final one is that making plots is like having a flashlight. You're, you're groping around in the dark trying to figure out some of these problems sometimes and then you make a plot and it is just immediately clear what's wrong. So it's really hard to overdo the plots when you're, when you're troubleshooting these type of things. That's it. That's the real conclusion. Thank you for watching.